for joining us. It is 10 a.m., so let's get started with our nature cast. Our um, nature cast, we've expanded it, so we are looking at a much broader topic than some of our earlier nature casts. We're excited to not only look at local topics and state topics, but we'll also expand out to regional and some of the more global topics, such as conservation, that we're talking about today using some of our wonderful Florida examples. So we provide these unique research-based topics, and um, today we have Dr. Jarrett Daniels with us from the University of Florida. And our guest speakers, they um, provide a platform to connect with you, and it allows them to share their passion as well as their research through our NatureCast, also giving us some ideas of how we can make a positive difference. Let me introduce uh, Dr. Jared Daniels. He is a curator at the Florida Museum of Natural History's McGuire Center for Lepidoptera and Biodiversity, and he's a professor in the Department of Entomology and Nematology at the University of Florida. His research focuses on insect ecology and conservation, with a particular emphasis on at-risk butterflies and native pollinators. As part of these efforts, his lab works across a diversity of landscapes, from agroecosystems to the built environment, and seeks to develop best land management and organism recovery practices. Additionally, Jarrett, he's a nature photographer, author, and naturalist. He has authored many scientific publications and successful, successful books on butterflies, insects, wildflowers, native plants, and wildlife landscaping, including Butterflies of Florida Field Guide, which I my copyright here that I use quite frequently, um, the Wildflowers of Florida Field Guide, Native Plant Gardening for Birds, Bees, and Butterflies of the Southeast, um, there's also the insects, bugs for kids, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Uh, Daniels to our nature cast. Thanks so much, Jean. It's a really a pleasure to be here this morning and really look forward to the, any opportunity to speak about butterflies and conservation as a whole. And as Jean mentioned, I'm, I'm a conservation biologist and ecologist, and I I work primarily on butterflies, but, but obviously butterflies are insects. So I always love to start with a few general facts about insects because unfortunately they're often vilified by many individuals and considered something to be controlled, not conserved. But I would make the strong argument that really we would be up a creek without a paddle without insects on this planet. And if you look around us today, insects and other arthropods really truly represent the most diverse components of terrestrial ecosystems. Currently, there are over 1 million described species, which account for well over 80% of all animal life on this planet. So it's literally really hard to, to take a step anywhere on the planet without seeing or encountering an insect. And I love this particular kind of factoid, and that is at any given time on planet Earth, there's an estimated 10 quintillion individual insects alive. And that's a number that's really hard to fathom. That gets into sort of the realm of the cosmos when it comes to uh, uh, just uncomprehensible figures. But that's a tremendous amount of insects alive on the planet at any given time. And of course, while there are certain insects that are obviously pests or issues of concern, the great majority of insects provide really key ecosystem services to the world around us. And of course, these are beneficial insects that provide services ranging from pollination, natural pest control, nutrient recycling, decomposition, food for other wildlife. And so if you're a birder, as an example, and you love inviting songbirds into your landscape, the food that they provide their young during the year are dominantly insects. So we rely on these creatures for the functionality, the stability, and really the productivity of natural systems, our food production systems. So again, we would be in, in deep challenges without insects on this planet. And if you drill down just into the service of pollination, of course, we know that many insects, butterflies included, deliver the service of pollination to wild plants, as well as many, many crop species. And Florida is an agro, um, uh, agricultural uh, kind of dominant state where agriculture just behind tourism is really the leading entity for productivity, economy, 
uh, and job production in the state of Florida. So obviously butterflies, moths, bees, flies, beetles, and wasps are just among some of the insects that deliver the service of pollination. And across the globe, about 87.5% of all flowering plants, uh, including many crop species, rely on animals, dominantly insects, to move pollen from one flower to another uh, to set seed and produce fruit. And so literally the productivity, the diversity of the plant community that you see around us, we owe to insects. And also the food on our tables, the price of that food, uh, the quality of that food, again, um, and really the stability of those food production systems. We rely a lot on insects delivering that service. And butterflies are always and have always been kind of the signature group of organisms because they are really one of the key insect groups that we want to invite into our home landscapes. They do not provide any real serious pest issues. They don't have any real serious concerns uh, providing harm to the general public and they're incredibly charismatic. And so they are really sort of the flying flowers out there of the insect world. And this slide shows our state butterfly of Florida, the zebra longwing or zebra heliconian. So they are really kind of that charismatic uh, kind of microfauna that we want to uh, invite into our home landscapes and, and really develop out spaces that will help conserve them long-term. And across the globe, there are about 18,000 species of butterflies within the United States, north of Mexico, about 750 species of butterflies, and within Florida proper, about 190 species of butterflies. So Florida is the most diverse state east of the Mississippi when it comes to butterfly, the number of butterfly species. So it's a great place to garden for butterflies, a great place to watch butterflies. And the reason that that number, 190 species, is a little bit fluid is the fact that Florida is a very long state. We kind of are at the confluence of more temperate species to the north and more tropical species to the south. And due to the proximity of the Caribbean, we often get many tropical strays uh, or even seasonal colonists into South Florida as an example. So that number from year to year vacillates a little bit, but again, a large number of species to take advantage of within Florida and an incredibly diverse state north to south when it comes to uh, species that uh, you, you really can't see in many other places in the US. But of course, we, don't, we know that when we're looking at biodiversity on this planet that uh, unfortunately the news is not good. And this of course is also affecting the, the insect diversity. And, and there's been a lot of uh, media attention, a lot of scientific publications looking at the decline of insects uh, at a global level, including some more sensationalized, like the one on the upper left-hand side of this slide, the insect apocalypse is here, uh, that might be you know, slightly overzealous in that uh, proclamation. But we know from a wide range of studies, local and more global in scope, that insects, particularly uh, well-known groups like butterflies and beads, are in fairly serious decline across the planet. And then this is worrisome primarily because of the things I mentioned earlier, the services that these insects provide to wild and agro ecosystems is really important to the natural world around us that if insects fell off the face of the earth tomorrow, we would be in really dire straits. And so it's really essential that we develop strategies to ensure that the future of this planet includes robust, diverse systems that can support uh, a, a great diversity and richness of insects, including butterflies. And my lab works, uh, as Jean mentioned, across many landscapes. We work in agricultural landscapes because obviously insects and pollinators are of economic importance for food security and crop production. We work into suburban urban landscapes and also wild landscapes and even systems that you might not consider to be important for conservation, such as roadsides or utility transmission easements. But kind of the, the mantra from, from my lab over the last several years has really been that in, we know that insects are declining in wild systems and conservation systems. And so in order to make up that ground, we really have an opportunity and a need to look across all systems. How do we manage uh, and conserve insects everywhere humans occupy, you know, in your backyard, in farmland, 
uh, as you go to work along road sites, all these are viable landscapes that can support insects, including butterflies, and, and ultimately also connect people more effectively to the natural world. And so no longer are these landscapes considered outside the purview of conservation. We have an opportunity and really um, a goal, a, a commitment that we have to improve these landscapes for wildlife and butterflies and other insects are great to do that with because they're small, they don't require a lot of space and even small spaces can support a great diversity of organisms. And as I mentioned, butterflies are a great opportunity to bring that nature uh, home to your own uh, individual property and landscape. But even in the state of Florida, of course, we know that biodiversity is declining. If you drive along I-75 at any time, you know that you know the, the world around us is changing, it's developing, we're losing habitat at a fairly sizable rate. And if you look at just one example from South Florida over the last decade or so, these are three taxa, three species of butterflies that are no longer present in the state of Florida. Two of them have actually been declared extinct by the US Fish and Wildlife Service, the Rockland grass skipper and the Zesto skipper and the Amon blue, the little butterfly on the far left-hand side of the slide. There have no, been no recent records of this butterfly within Florida for the past 15 years or so. So these are extinction level events that have occurred without really any media fanfare. They're happening under our noses. And this of course is something that as a conservation biologist, we, we want to ensure doesn't happen to other critical insect species and other butterfly species that we hold dear. But this is the world that we're fighting against and trying to ensure that butterflies and other insects are secure and actually making a reverse curve and ensuring that their populations are actually growing and not declining over time. So a great deal of what my lab does in collaboration with many, many other talented individuals and stakeholders is really developing kind of plans and putting plans in place to look at how do we take species that are declining and reverse that curve so that over time we can manage appropriately, we can develop you know, science-driven conservation and management practices that will hopefully help ensure that these species are gonna be around for you know, many, many years to come. And so we, we do this in many ways. We work with partners, we develop out detailed plans, we try to publish on uh, developing improved standards for best practices within conservation. And unlike large mammals and plants, even uh, the world of insect conservation is still fairly new. So we're, we're learning as we go. And our goal really is to, you know, develop out the science of insect conservation and ensure that we have strong plans in place so that even if we fail with one organism, we'll learn through those mistakes so that we can enhance the success of the conservation of the next butterfly that comes along that needs help. And over the years, we've gotten a tremendous amount of assistance from funders and other organizations. And one of those is a non-traditional partner that uh, you may consider to be more of a media company, and that is the, the Disney uh, Corporation. And they uh, have maintained the Disney Conservation Fund for the last 26 years. And they've actually given a lot of money globally to conservation. However, about eight years ago, they decided to take a slight turn and provide deep funding for 10 organism groups around the planet. These were high need, high charismatic groups. Uh, and luckily they included butterflies in that list. And so the University of Florida, including my lab, was able to secure funding from them along with sea turtles to the University of Florida. And Disney really took a, a long view on this. They understand that conservation does not happen overnight. It takes time to be successful. And so this was a decade long initiative to provide deep funding, to really work collectively with stakeholders to provide longitudinal funding so that we could really see the efforts uh, and well-planned conservation work over you know, multiple years and not just one or two or three years. So this was really quite unique as a funding opportunity. And with that initiative, uh, we worked to craft out detailed conservation and recovery plans for about 42 different taxa in Florida and California. And not because Disney does business in California and Florida, but 
those were the two states in the US that have the most diversity of species and also the most severity of decline. They, they share a number of similarities in you know, unique taxa, but also heavy population pressure and heavy habitat loss. So we worked over the last uh, several years to really develop detailed plans for, for many of these incredibly charismatic and incredibly rare insects, many of which are listed under the uh, Endangered Species Act. And you will see some species that you're probably aware of, like the monarch butterfly, which is obviously you know, fairly, still fairly common, but is a species that's been petitioned for a listing. And so our goal with these projects is to work with other talented individuals and stakeholders to do our due diligence to ensure that we have good plans and a solid foundation in place, and, and then work on the ground with uh, stakeholders, land managers, volunteers, to ensure that we're not only focusing on species level conservation and doing what we need, we need to do to potentially breed butterflies in captivity, reintroduce them, but also manage and restore habitat. So when we put those organisms back in those systems, the habitat is appropriate and is managed appropriately, appropriately for the long-term conservation of these species. And th these have been incredibly rewarding projects because we work in some really amazing systems with incredibly rare organisms and a lot of dedicated, talented people. And conservation is truly a social enterprise. And so that has been one of, out of my great rewards in getting connected with other individuals that share a common ethic and are incredibly talented in the work that they do. And so I wanna take you through this morning, uh, kind of some of the species and projects that we work with in Florida. Uh, many species you may have heard of, but hopefully some you will not have heard of, but I hope will kind of raise your end or kind of, you know, tweak your antennae, so to speak, to understand that these species are really precious to the state of Florida and they need a lot of help to ensure that they have a solid future within the Sunshine State. So the first butterfly is the Miami Blue. And this is a small little blue that has a wingspan about the width of your thumbnail, it's a butterfly that probably if it did not have the name Miami associated with it, nobody would know about it and it would not be listed under the Endangered Species Act as endangered. It's a butterfly that if you go back in time uh, 20 years or so ago, was actually widespread across coastal portions of Florida from about Cape Canaveral around the southern tip of Florida through the Florida Keys and up to the Tampa St. Pete area. Over those past 20, 25 years, it's declined precipitously north to south to the point where now it only occurs in a few isolated islands to the west of Key West. And the image on this slide is actually the island chain of the Marquesas, uh, these really low lying islands that harbor habitat along the beach area of these islands that supports the host plants for these butterflies. But these are now the only places in the world that this butterfly occurs. This butterfly is endemic to Florida. So if it goes extinct, it'll be gone forever. And these two small areas where the butterfly occurs are, are really unique little spaces. But if you bend down to the Florida Keys, you know that these islands are at low level elevation. One tropical storm or hurricane or certainly the trajectory of sea level rise under climate change scenarios really threaten the future of this butterfly in those locations. So our goal is really to ensure that we can expand the range of this butterfly historically uh, back to where it should be uh, and hopefully in improve the success of its uh, future in Florida. And, and luckily for me and, and my lab, these are absolutely gorgeous systems in which to work. And here are two technicians of mine, Taylor Hunt on the right and Sarah Steele Cabrera on the left. Uh, going out to their boat as they move from island to island to survey for this butterfly. So they are fantastic systems in which to work. And this is sort of the habitat of the butterfly and what it looks like, kind of a coastal berm system where two species of leguminous plants, Florida Keys blackbead and gray knicker bean, which are the two host plants for the butterfly occur. And one unique thing about this little butterfly is that its caterpillars have associations with several species of native and non-native ants. And this slide shows two caterpillars, which are green on both sides of that stem, being actively tended, not attacked, by two workers of the Florida carpenter ant, the genus Campanotus. 
And these ants are amazingly uh, good associates for these ants. They actively tend the caterpillars. Uh, they actively uh, defend these caterpillars. And I have a little video to show you uh, that hopefully can kind of describe more of the association that these ants actually have. So this is a large worker Campanotus ant, and you, you will quickly see him coming in association to uh, a large Miami blue caterpillar. And those little tiny white kind of powder puff uh, projections that stick out are unique structures um, that provide uh, or disseminate semiochemicals or pheromones that tell the ant that, hey, I'm your friend, don't attack me. They also have little organs on the top of their body which secrete carbohydrate rich droplets that the ants themselves feed on. And in return for that food reward, the ants roam around the adjacent plant that that caterpillar is on and they actively defend that caterpillar from any other insect or predator, even a small lizard. And they have very large mandibles so they can inflict a fairly painful bite. And the larvae also can emit an alarm pheromone. So if they're being attacked by say a wasp or a predatory ant, they can actually call the good ants over to defend them. So it's an amazing association that these two organisms have. And this association is really critical for the conservation of this butterfly. Uh, so much so that ants that are actively tending caterpillars will defend uh, uh, virtually all other kind of uh, enemies away. And those ants, those larvae that are not in ant attendance, majority of those larvae will actually be predated by other insects and other uh, vertebrate predators. So that association leads to about a 90% survival rate of the larvae if those tending ants are present in the uh, surrounding system where this butterfly occurs. And a good portion of our role with this butterfly has been to bring the butterfly into captivity at the Florida Museum of Natural History on the campus of the University of Florida to act as an assurance population in case something happens to the wild population uh, to the west of Key West and also to breed sufficient numbers under controlled environmental conditions that we can release individuals back into the environment to bolster existing populations and ultimately establish new self-sustaining populations through time. And this has been an ongoing effort of ours for the last uh, many, many years, but here are views into our lab where we, we raise hundreds and hundreds of these on a monthly basis. This is a butterfly that has a continuous generation throughout the year. So over the course of 12 months, it will have about eight to 10 generations. So in the lab condition, they essentially breed continuously over time. And at any given time, any given month, we can produce up to about a thousand individuals in the lab. Just this past April, the month ago, we produced over 1600 individuals in captivity and released over 1100 individuals back into the wild. So it's been a really signature program of ours and a very, very successful program over time. And we've also used this butterfly as kind of a model system for understanding how we deal with organism reintroduction, organism breeding in the lab, and general research into endangered species. So it's been a good lab rad, if you will, for understanding more about how we deliver best practices for insect conservation and recovery. And so once those individuals are produced in our lab, we take them down to the Florida Keys or other areas where we have targeted releases. And we try to also experimentally look at these questions. So we, we try to look at, for example, what life stage is most appropriate to release these individuals back into the environment and collect a lot of data so that we can inform the system. So it might turn out that adults and pupae might be more effective at establishing populations than say, releasing caterpillars back into the wild. And here you see these little PVC containers, each of which include a little mesh piece of metal at the top and mesh at the bottom to allow rainfall to pass through, but not allow a vertebrate predator such as a small mouse or a lizard to crawl into that tube to predate the pupae that are at the base of uh, that little tube. And then uh, the holes at the top are wide enough that once those pupae emerge and adult butterflies uh, have spread their wings, they can actually escape those tubes 
without any human assistance and fly away into the surrounding system. And each one of these tubes can be deployed in the field. It can be geo-referenced and, geo and uh, geo-tagged. And we can go back and actually look at the success of which pupae successfully emerged, which pupae died, which pupae were predated. And it gives us a lot of data to understand the success of our efforts ultimately. And we also have developed larger uh, mechanisms to release a lot of pupae at one time uh, and deploy these actually hanging from trees in different areas in the environment. We also have done comparative studies looking at releasing larvae and also releasing adult butterflies in these habitats. And again, our goal is to try to move the field of insect conservation work forward and always try to experimentally test assumptions in the field so that we again can determine, you know, as an example, what particular practice delivers the best chance of success in the field. And where possible, we also try to do this in a way that can educate the public. So here are a couple people from my lab at that picnic table and the little cage has several hundred Miami blue butterflies. And this was a release we did at Bahia Honda State Park earlier this spring. And in the course of that uh, release with uh, the Florida Department of, of uh, Environmental Protection, we uh, amassed this crowd of tourists that came to Bahia Honda, obviously for beaches, not for butterflies. And they really enjoyed and actually filmed the release of the butterflies at Bahia Honda. So uh, where possible, some of these uh, sort of outreach activities can be very, very organic on the ground. And then we also look at questions like if you release butterflies just naturally into the environment or you provide a sort of a protected environment from predators, how will that, you know, enhance the success of establishment? So here is Taylor Hunt. And we, we set up oftentimes these large uh, walk-in flight cages over habitat in different areas. And in this context, we were actually comparing both wild releases into the environment wild releases into the sort of safe space, if you will, and then also comparing adult releases and pupil releases to again, collect more data to really inform, you know, what is the best practice to establish self-sustaining population? So, you know, while a lot of this is sort of, you know, maybe a little bit more gray area conservation, we try to really involve hard science into the work that we do and collect a lot of data. So, our results are really data driven and we have good you know, ability to say something worked and why it worked or something failed and why it failed because that's the kind of holy grail of conservation and informing uh, the system and why something worked or why something failed and learning from those lessons. And then we, we also work with other partners such as Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden. And in, in this slide, you see on the left-hand side, the state of Florida, and all these little numbered sites. And so these were all potential release sites for this butterfly. And you can imagine that while we may be able to do the eye test walking out into the field and saying, well, that, that habitat looks good for this butterfly, that's not good enough. We wanna have a lot of data saying, we're comparing site A to site B and site A by the data we collect is actually a much better potential release site than site B. And so for each of these 27 locations, we collected a lot of on the ground field data, comparing site to site, looking at host plant density, looking at nectar availability, looking at things such as, you know, logistics in order to get to those sites. And you might not consider that to be very important, but if a site exists on an island and you have to take a boat to that site, it's very difficult to visit. It's very difficult to do monitoring of those populations long-term. So all these different criteria feed into our system and our kind of matrix when we actually compare one site to another. And this gives us a rating scale that's data-driven to say, okay, these top five sites are really the top five sites for targeting for organism reintroduction. And here is the data to back that up. And so you can see on this slide some of the metrics that we use and the data that we collect to really compare those sites over time. And this gives us a really strong level of confidence that the sites that we're putting the butterflies back in have the best chance of actually 
yielding and sustaining populations in the long term. And then we can segue to another butterfly, a much larger butterfly, and this is Shouse's swallowtail. This is a butterfly that maybe some of you have heard of, and this is the only federally listed swallowtail butterfly in the United States. It occurs only in South Florida. It was originally listed back in 1911 around the Miami-Dade area. It is another butterfly like the Miami blue that's endemic to the state of Florida. While it has additional subspecies throughout the Caribbean, this is our butterfly here in, in the state of Florida. Again, it's listed under the endangered species list as endangered, and it, it's just an incredibly charismatic butterfly. It is exclusively restricted to a very specialized system called har hardwood hammock, uh, where the butterfly occupies it. It's unlike many other swallowtails, which are very good at navigating large open areas. This butterfly flies more like a zebra longwing and navigating within the deep understory and dense understory of the tropical hardwood hammock. So it likes these shady confines of this very dense hardwood system. It has at least two flights in Florida, a dominant spring flight uh, that's happening right now and a slightly later flight in the late summer. And there is evidence that uh, this butterfly can hold over in the pupil stage for many years. It's sort of a, a butterfly that's driven by the rainy season. So it overwinters as a pupa. And when the rains come to South Florida, it cues those butterflies to emerge, predominantly because it feeds on two species of citrus that flush out new growth when the spring rains come. And that's the only resource that the butterflies, caterpillars can utilize. They cannot survive very well on more mature foliage. They need those young tender leaves. So as the spring rains come, so does this butterfly. And so under future scenarios of climate change where you know, weather systems and climate will change, the spring rains can be fairly sporadic. And so that can affect this butterfly's ability to adapt to these systems and ultimately survive long-term. So this is another butterfly that is kind of has a tenuous future when it comes to the changing climate uh, and also long-standing drought can really affect this butterfly. And so this is where this butterfly occurs naturally right now. This, these are the only places that you can find this butterfly. Fortunately, all of these are under conservation. It co-occurs with two other large swallowtails, the Bahamian swallowtail and the giant swallowtail. Many of you know the giant swallowtail as a very common butterfly in Florida. And maybe if you have potted citrus in your backyard, you know that that butterfly will lay eggs on potted citrus as well. But these are the only places that Shouse's swallowtail will occur. John Penny Camp State Park, Crocodile Lake National Wildlife Re Refuge, Dagny Johnson, and the islands of Biscayne National Park. And these are, again, fascinating places to work. Uh, many of these you have to take boats out to, uh, and we work with our partners at the National Park Service to go out to the islands of Biscayne National Park, predominantly Elliott Key, which has been the heart of this butterfly's population over time. And once we're out on these islands, we, we do a number of things. We, we record and monitor these populations over time so we understand how populations are doing from year to year and over the long term. So here's a student of mine, Dale Halberter, marking an adult Shouse swallowtail. They're large enough where you can actually put uh, a large number on it, uh, essentially tagging these butterflies and then following them through time to understand how far they move, how long they live, uh, where they actually occupy on the island. So we can get a lot of data from doing this kind of mark recapture uh, release experiments. But these are challenging systems because they don't spray for mosquitoes. And so this is the typical uh, situation where if you're handling butterflies without uh, protected hands, they're just slaughtered with salt marsh mosquitoes. And on good years for the butterfly, they're great years for mosquitoes. So it's a, a really fun, and I use fun in quotations, environment to work in because it is dominated by millions of salt marsh mosquitoes literally buzzing around your head at any given time. So it's very challenging environments to work in. And through time, this butterfly has had a kind of a, a very volatile history in Florida. From the time that it was listed, it has gone up and down in population numbers. And a couple of key dates on this graph are 1992. This is when Hurricane Andrew slammed into Southeast Florida. Uh, at that point, we really thought that that hurricane had taken out this butterfly, that we were watching an extinction event 
fortuitous, fortuitously that did not happen. And we actually took butterflies into captivity in, in 1992 and conducted a number of wild releases. And you see the recovery of that butterfly. And then you see kind of it falling off in the late 1990s. And then in the early 2000s, funding dried up and we really did not have a good understanding of the, the current situation of this butterfly. So in 2012, the Imperial Butterflies of Florida Working Group, a group that, that we started here at the University of Florida, conducted the first really range-wide survey of this butterfly involving all the agency, all the environmental agencies of Florida, hundreds of individuals on the ground. And in 2012, we only found four individuals of this butterfly existing in the wild. And so this was a huge red flag. And so it triggered a number of different things. It triggered the ability to bring this butterfly back into the lab to, again, use it as an assurance population in case the wild population was really going extinct. And then secondarily, to breed sufficient organisms in the lab to release them back into the wild. And so these are some views, uh, again, into my lab. And you see different life stages, including the large mature caterpillar on the far right hand side of the slide, which is a, a really spectacular caterpillar with bright white osmateria, which are these fleshy uh, organs that they can stick out uh, when they're being attacked by a predator. And again, it's a really fantastic butterfly and just a little bit of video here to show you uh, into our um, screen enclosures and greenhouses here where the butterflies are flying and mating and laying eggs. It's a it's a great butterfly to have in captivity because it can maneuver well within the dense understory of that tropical hardwood hammock habitat. It adapts really well to captivity and can occupy even small spaces and be quite productive. And one female butterfly in captivity can lay over 500 eggs. So we can do a lot with a very small population and build it up quite quickly. And so it's another butterfly that has good utility for this type of sort of more aggressive hands-on conservation in laboratory breeding and organism reintroduction. And then those organisms that we produce in captivity are slated for wild release. And here is Matthew Standridge from my lab releasing a second instar caterpillar uh, out into the wild using uh, a camel hair paintbrush and gently uh, coaxing that caterpillar onto the terminal growth of sea torchwood, its host plant. We also try to involve our stakeholders uh, and land managers into these releases when possible. So on the left-hand side of the slide is one of our partners with the National Park Service releasing an adult butterfly. The far right-hand picture show myself with several people from U.S. Fish and Wildlife and Florida Department of Environmental Protection releasing both adult butterflies and mature caterpillars into the field on northern Key Largo. And we also use or deploy community scientists to help us with the survey work of this butterfly. And this has been a really rewarding and successful project because it has involved a lot of highly dedicated community volunteers that are just remarkable butterflyers that go into these dense hardwood hammock systems with thousands of mosquitoes, mosquito jackets on at times of Florida where it's hotter than Hades and humidity and the rainfall is happening every day. These are not like going to a beach environment. This is dense hammock environment where um, going out in the field is not a fun exercise. And so we rely on them uh, extensively to collect data on the health of these populations and also help us monitor the post-release populations when we put organisms back into the wild. And so they're essential to the work that we do. And so it's it's just another kind of example that conservation requires a community of individuals to make it happen. And I'm very, very happy to report uh, that over the last several years, this project has been exceedingly successful. So if you remember back to 2012, when we had recorded only four individuals in the field, over the last several years, owing to a lot of individuals helping, a lot of individuals uh, butterflies making the way back into the environment from our lab here in Gainesville, a lot of habitat restoration, a little natural recovery. We are now in 2021. Last year, we recorded the most individuals ever found in the wild in the history of monitoring this butterfly. Well over 1,400 individuals recorded across the entire range of this butterfly. So this shows that the work that we are doing in, in collaboration with many, many other 
individuals is really reaping the benefits. And we hope that this trajectory will continue into the future. So again, a record number of 1,700 individuals recorded uh, in 2021. And we hope that the conditions this year uh, will continue to expand that population number. And I'm also really happy that this butterfly will also be featured in the Nat America's National Park Series uh, by the National Geographic Society uh, later this year. So they're filming the um, Biscayne National Park as part of that series. And they're telling the terrestrial story of Biscayne National Park through the eyes of Shouse of Swallowtail. So you'll be able to see our conservation work and really some fantastic footage of this butterfly through this series that will be launched, I believe on Disney Plus, uh, hopefully later this year. And then as part of this effort, in addition to restoring the organism itself, we've been working with Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden in propagating its host plant, which is Sea Torchwood, uh, and providing those seedlings to other land managers and other agencies to outplant these, to build back habitat, to restore habitat, to expand uh, potential future areas where this butterfly can either naturally expand to, or we can reintroduce organisms to into the future. So this has been, a, again, a very successful collaboration uh, with Fairchild in South Florida. And then another effort that we have with this butterfly is as part of the approved draft recovery plan, it calls for the establishment of new self-sustaining populations within the historic range of this butterfly that currently are sites that do not have the butterfly today. And so one of these is Lignavite Key Botanical State Park in the lower Florida Keys. And we started releasing individuals here in 2020 and continued those efforts in 2021, putting back adult butterflies, larvae, and pupae with the Florida Park Service and other community volunteers. And I'm very, very happy to say that in our efforts of putting individuals back in the field, we actually have now sort of seen uh, the benefits of that exercise. We recorded individuals last year in 2021 from the previous year's releases. And also this spring, we recorded individuals from last year's releases. So it looks like, although it's early days, that we're actually having success in establishing populations at this particular uh, state park. So this is the goal in the future is to pick an additional locations that currently do not have the butterfly that we can expand outward and grow these populations over time to create a network of populations that will hopefully be more resilient to changes, more resilient to any type of impacts from climate change or other disturbances, and again, create a future in Florida for this butterfly long term. And um, again, a lot of evidence that this butterfly is actually taking uh, within uh, Lignavite Key uh, State Botanical Park. And then other projects that we work on in Florida include a, a wide range of other butterflies. And so this is one little butterfly that occurs in South Florida. This is a pine rockland specialist. This is the Florida dusky wing butterfly, a butterfly that you know many people may have never even heard of in Florida. It is a a butterfly as a pine rockland specialist. So it occurs in, in only a small number of sites. Pine rockland is a globally imperiled system. Less than 1% of this habitat type exists in Florida from historic times. So it's, it's a habitat that is you know, decreasing rapidly, primarily because it occurs in areas where you know, we love to build. It, occur, it occurred historically around the Miami-Dade area, of course, the development of Miami-Dade and Homestead has really curtailed that system. It occurs throughout many areas of the Florida Keys as well. So as part of our efforts with this butterfly, we tried to use it as a model organism to understand how connectivity uh, was between these pine rockland fragments throughout Southeast Florida. So we collected genetic samples from this butterfly and we kind of tracked the movement of those butterflies from one location to another to understand you know, really how connected were these individual little habitat uh, remnants? And could we build out areas that could be targeted for maybe developing stepping stones that could help reconnect these systems more effectively? And in our work, we, we generated some really good results that helped us understand that network more effectively. But also in the process, we realized that 
hey, this butterfly was way more imperiled than we thought initially going into the project. So it's a butterfly that also is declining quite rapidly. So we, we learned a lot through this effort uh, and we're now teaming up again with Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden and their Connect to Protect project in South Florida to outplant locust berry, which is the host plant for this butterfly, across a network of suburban and urban sites within the greater Miami-Dade area to again provide habitat even in you know, backyards, community gardens, other areas within a heavily built environment that hopefully can support this butterfly and, and act as stepping stones to help move the butterfly you know, naturally from one natural area to another. So this is again a, a highly rewarding project that we've learned a lot in working on it that has informed sort of the network of conservation and management across this entire system. And then some of the other species that we work with and systems in which we work include this little brown skipper called Duke skipper, uh, which is, exists in, trop in um, hydric hammock systems across central and north Florida. And this is a little brown job of the insect world, one butterfly that very few people have probably seen in the wild. It's a butterfly that because it occupies these mesic kind of wetland environments, it's also lost a lot of ground over the last uh, several decades, predominantly because of water withdrawals in Florida and, and changing hydric levels due to urban development and also cattle ranching. And so it has lost a lot of viable habitat over time. And the areas where this butterfly currently occupy have shifted dramatically over the past 20, 25 years. So we have a project going right now with funding from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to evaluate where this butterfly actually is. You know, is it stable? Uh, where is it actually, uh, where are areas that it's actually occupying? And then also to collect genetic samples to understand, you know, the genetic health of this population or populations within Florida uh, to help provide additional data to kind of craft out future conservation and management plans and whether or not this species actually deserves listing under the Endangered Species uh, Act itself, because it is a, a butterfly that has declined considerably. But as you will see within the systems uh, photographed and pictured on this uh, slide, uh, and the individual on the far left, this is uh, Dean Jew, who's a retired biologist from the Florida Natural Areas Inventory. These are, again, very challenging systems to get to. These are, are true wetlands where you have to walk in with waders uh, you know, up to your, your hips uh, to get into these systems, uh, very, very challenging environments which define the butterfly. So you might consider butterfly work to be you know, open area, kind of sunny, a lot of flowers, easy to get to. That's, that's not the case in many areas of Florida. So many of these systems are quite challenging in which to work. And then another butterfly that's also a little brown job, this is the palatka skipper or sawgrass skipper because it feeds on sawgrass. Uh, and there are two races of this butterfly in Florida, two subspecies, one that occurs in the lower Florida Keys and one that occurs in peninsular Florida. And we have a project, again, funded by U.S. Fish and Wildlife that's looking at the population dynamics and area of occupancy of this butterfly in the lower Florida Keys to see, you know, where is it? Does it have healthy population numbers? Is it, is it in decline? And then also asking similar questions at a genetic level about, you know, connectivity of these individual systems. You know, how, how is it operating within the area that it currently occupies? And is it, is it a butterfly that has lost a lot of genetic diversity over time because it has declined? And then also comparing it to the uh, population within mainland Florida. Are they really truly the same subspecies? Are they different species entirely? How, how much have they diverged over time through isolation? Or are they actually connected to one another through the island chain of the Florida Keys? So we're asking a lot of questions that have broad ramifications to conservation and to future management. And again, these are not particularly great systems in which to work. These are coastal um, you know, marshes. They're, they're difficult in which to get to. And the butterfly itself exists in fairly low, low numbers. You may spend thousands of hours in the field and only see one or two individuals. So it's, it's hard to collect a lot of data from these really rare organisms because there just are not that many of them out there 
uh, to survey. And so it's a challenging system and organism in which to work as well. And then other kind of really interesting butterflies in which we work include this little brown butterfly called the frosted elephant. And so if any of you um, have moved down to Florida from the Northeast or Midwest, this is a butterfly that across uh, you know, New York and New Hampshire and Wisconsin and Minnesota co-occurs with the Carner blue butterfly, which is a federally listed butterfly. Uh, and it actually extends down throughout much of Eastern North America into North Florida. But it's a butterfly that's being petitioned for listing and is under evaluation for listing as endangered under the Endangered Species Act. And because it occurs down to Florida, those are the kind of Southern terminus of this population. And they're quite unique populations. And if you look at kind of future resiliency due to climate change, these are really important populations. And in Florida, they occupy these sort of sand hill and pineland locations around Apalachicola National Forest and other locations. And so it's a butterfly that occupies these really cool, unique uh, imperiled systems as well. It feeds on sundial lupin. And so we have a large project funded by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to look at the range-wide population genetics of this butterfly to inform not only listing, but really, you know, do some of these individual populations harbor really unique genetic material that might be critical to conserve to enable kind of future evolutionary potential and resiliency of this butterfly. And so we work with partners in North Florida to uh, do a lot of the sampling for this butterfly. And through the process, we also develop new techniques for sampling, particularly we're always interested in understanding how can we push the needle when it comes to non-destructive sampling. So historically, you would collect a specimen, grind that specimen up, extract the DNA for any type of genetic uh, projects. Well, obviously, if this butterfly or any butterfly is endangered or incredibly imperiled, you want to conserve the organism. You, you want to do little harm to the organism. And so even the potential of taking a leg for genetic sampling enables you or necessitates that you capture that organism. And there's always a chance for something happening that could injure the organism, the process. So through this project, we actually looked at another way of non-destructive sampling, which included collecting hatched eggs in the field and using the chorion, the shell of that egg, to get enough DNA out of that in individual egg to have the high quality genetic material to ask those sort of population level questions. And this was really very successful. So this shows that even in the work that we're doing, we're trying to push the envelope into developing techniques that could inform not only this butterfly's conservation, but be techniques that could be broadly used across many other different species that could really help ensure that we do little harm or no harm to the populations we want to study uh, uh, itself. And then um, sort of the last species I'm gonna talk about today is, is of course the monarch. And so this is a, a butterfly that's well known by the general public. It's a butterfly that is in many ways the best known insect in North America uh, and kind of the icon for insect conservation. It's gained a lot of attention it's generated a lot of tension as well for pollinator conservation, for just insect conservation as a whole, for across agencies, across the general public. And so it's also been a butterfly that over the last 25 years or 30 years has shown steep declines in both the Western and Eastern population and has actually been petitioned for listing as threatened under the US Endangered Species Act. And in Florida, Florida is a very unique state in a lot of ways, and it has in many ways, a unique series of monarch populations that have unique stories that add to that kind of broader conservation perspective. And so we, we try to focus on the Florida-based populations uh, through, through my lab's work. And Florida, as an example, has a Southeast Florida population, which is non-migratory. It's the only non-migratory population of monarch butterflies in the uh, continental US. So it has really unique um, elements of this kind of national level population, if you will. And one of the kind of questions that we really have is, 
you look at the state of Florida, we, we also know that uh, through long-term monitoring in Florida that monarch populations are declining pretty much at pace with, with the national level. We've seen about an 80% decline over the last 25 years, uh, predominantly due to loss of breeding habitat and other you know, environmental changes. And in Florida, there are several species of milkweed. There are actually 21 species of milkweed. Not all of them are great hosts for the monarch, but a few are, are really key hosts. And one of them is pictured on this slide. This is sandhill milkweed. This is Asclepius humastrata. And this is a plant that becomes vegetative and starts to come up in the environment early in the year at a really critical time when monarch butterflies are moving out of Mexico and are returning to the deep south on that return migration. And so this is a plant that's available to them when they reach the deep south, including Florida. And because of that, it sort of is the sentinel kind of key indicator that kind of ensures that monarchs have resources. And as that spring generation goes, so does much of the East Coast uh, return migration and repopulation of that broader area as well. So Florida is a key state when it comes to the return migration of the monarch. And because Sand Hill in Florida is a dwindled habitat, it's, it's, it's a habitat that, that deserves conservation and has been fragmented and reduced in scope significantly over time, where we tend to find a lot of populations of this milkweed are in non-traditional conservation areas along roadways, along power line easements, in pastures, any area that has consistent disturbance that might mimic fire because it's a fire dominated plant. So we were curious in asking the question, how important are Florida roadways when it comes to supporting this plant and ultimately the monarch? So we worked in a funded project with the Department of Transportation to survey all FDOT maintained roadways in North Florida from Barocala north to Jacksonville and over to Tallahassee. And on this map, the areas outlined, the roadways outlined in blue have pretty good populations of this particular milkweed species. The areas highlighted in red have ultra high density populations of milkweed. So if you're in the Department of Transportation and you wanna help conserve the monarch, these are kind of targeted areas where you might consider reducing mowing at a time when monarchs are coming back into Florida and ensuring that these populations of milkweed can set seed effectively so they don't become sink populations over time. They don't dwindle over time because the mowers just keep cutting the blossoms off and don't allow these plants to go to seed. And as you can see by the picture in the lower right-hand side on the slide, these plants are widely used by the monarch. They support a lot of monarch breeding. So these roadway populations are really critical. And because roadways are mowed regularly, they do mimic that disturbance from fire. And we're seeing that milkweed populations were actually declining from conservation lands because of potentially the inability to burn as frequently as necessary. So roadways are becoming increasingly important for milkweed and monarch conservation within Florida. And as part of these efforts in association with the Department of Transportation, we're also looking for novel ways of involving technology to monitor these roadside populations. So we started a new project this spring using artificial intelligence and deep learning and drones to fly along roadways to capture uh, these images of milkweed populations to see if we could you know, use and deploy this technology in a more effective way that would not be the traditional boots on the ground monitoring to capture landscape level data to use machine learning to understand are these populations increasing, decreasing, or remaining stable over time. And I think this is a, a really exciting trajectory to conservation and technology and marrying those two ultimate disciplines. And so we're, we're still um, collecting data, but I think it's very, very promising that drones and machine learning will be able to not only detect plants along roadways, but actually give us a lot of data to say, you know, how management along these roadsides is affecting these populations of milkweeds long term. And then another project we have at the Department of Transportation is looking at building breeding habitat for the monarch. So if you drive along any Florida roadway, you might often look off into the distance and see a retention basin, a stormwater retention basin. They might be dry, they might be wet, 
but they're they're deployed across you know all Florida roadways. And traditionally, these are just sort of waste areas. They don't really serve much purpose outside of stormwater management. But these are really opportunities for rebuilding habitat because they're always going to be managed. They're always going to be maintained. Uh, and in many areas, they have deep slopes, which you know might be uh, in need of some help for erosion. So we have a project looking at revegetating these retention basins and outplanting species of milkweed to support monarch conservation and many other native blooming plants that will build out not only butterfly habitat, but pollinator habitat. And the nice thing about these compared to roadsides is they don't have the same management or safety constraints as roadsides. So they really are sort of a tabula rasa when it comes to an opportunity for conservation. And the other benefit is they are all along Florida roadways. So they're like pearls in a necklace to connect habitat uh, across vast areas of Florida and beyond. So we're exploring this project looking at, you know, really outplanting, you know, thousands and thousands of plants um, into these areas and recording not only the success of the plant establishment, but also the use of the monarch butterfly of these habitat systems. And so this is an ongoing project that again is been very rewarding and we've got really good collaborators with the Department of Transportation and others, but it's also feeding into this broad national initiative called the Monarch Candidate Conservation Agreement with assurances that transportation and energy providers enter into uh, preliminarily to the Monarch being potentially listed under the Endangered Species Act. So as part of this agreement, uh, the Department of Transportation here in Florida has to be good citizens and actually set aside or manage landscape that they have under their purview a percentage of that appropriately for the monarch and monarch conservation. So this can help them accomplish those kind of longitudinal goals uh, by creating more monarch breeding habitat and more monarch nectar habitat. And then uh, just a few last minute things before I end uh, today, and that is just a few other initiatives that we have at the University of Florida that are related to insect conservation and butterfly conservation overall. And one of them uh, is looking at the development of a wildlife friendly plant certification program. Right now, if you go to a big box store um, and you buy a plant, you, you really have no idea per se, is it, a, is it a good plant for butterflies? Is it a bad plant for butterflies? Or is it safe for butterfly larval consumption? And this has reared its ugly head with the occurrence of tropical milkweed, which is really the most commonly commercial available milkweed for monarchs, but it's a non-native to Florida and it's commercially produced. And because milkweeds have high pest predation pressure from aphids and other soft-bodied insects, a lot of growers during that plant production use systemic insecticides and other really lethal insecticides to insects during that production. So when you buy a plant, you, you don't really know if this plant has been you know, treated with these systemic insecticides, which have a long life within the plant. And we've done studies at the University of Florida looking at the impact of these chemicals, including the plants themselves, on the mortality to monarch larvae. And we found that you know, most of these plants are, are really lethal to monarchs. So they're doing the exact opposite that consumers are buying these plants for. They're buying them to help support monarchs and monarch populations, when in the general case, a lot of these plants are deleterious to the monarch butterflies, at least for a short-term period. And so we're trying to look at alternatives to using these lethal chemicals in plant production that can provide growers with efficacious pest control, but provide some level of consistency and confidence that when you go buy a plant, it's going to be safe for the organism you actually want to attract. And then also evaluating the attractiveness of these plants overall, so that if you went to a big box store, you might be able to say, well, okay, these are the top five plants that are available. And the data show that if you want to attract butterflies, these are the five plants that you need to buy, and they're safe for the organisms you want to attract. So this is a long-term project that we have ongoing, and we've, we've, uh, we've learned a lot in the process so far. But the goal ultimately is to provide, you know, kind of this certificate of authenticity, as you will, that, you know, a consumer can go and buy a plant with confidence, knowing that it's safe and it's been highly rated for the organisms that 
uh, you want to attract. And then as part of my lab too, we, we often try to do a lot of uh, engagement with the general public and other stakeholders because we are the University of Florida and the Florida Museum as a whole. We have a broader mission for educating the public and you know, interacting with the public and insects and butterflies particularly are great for that because people love butterflies. So it's a great tool, if you will, to engender public support for conservation. And so if you come to the Florida Museum of Natural History and you can actually see the workings of my lab through these open windows. Um, so our lab is visible to 200,000 annual visitors every day of the year, except for Christmas, uh, Christmas Eve and Thanksgiving. You can see these butterflies being propagated in our lab during many times of the year. Uh, so it's a great opportunity to learn. And we, we also create programming. Uh, we create a lot of products, including coloring books, uh, brochures, signage in the wild uh, to educate the public about the work that we do. And we also have entered into a really unique collaboration, uh, which is one I'm actually quite proud of with the craft brewing industry. So we create butterfly beers that are themed for the butterfly species on which we work. And for many of these, uh, they've been wonderfully successful. And each time we brew a beer, we try to actually push the envelope even further. So if you remember back to my mention of the frosted elfin butterfly, we did a beer two years ago with that butterfly. And we try to either include an element of the habitat or a thematic thread of the host plant or something with the beer. And for that butterfly, we actually went into the field and we swabbed the adult butterflies to collect uh, yeast from the butterflies themselves and use that in the brewing process. And so the beer was essentially populated, if you will, by the yeast from the butterfly itself. So these, are, these have been wonderfully successful programs to generate money that goes directly to conservation and also reaches a different audience than sort of comes directly to the Florida Museum of Natural History. So it's been, it's been really fun and, and uh, exciting over the years. And we have a new initiative currently for a national beer released uh, surrounding the conservation of the monarch. And the initiative is called Restore the Reign of the Monarch. And the beer itself is called Rain. It's an imperial stout. And much like many of the other beers that have come out for social causes, we are providing the beer recipe and all the graphic uh, content for the labels, and we're trying to get craft breweries around uh, the nation, including in Canada and Mexico, to sign up. And we'll give them all that information, the recipe itself, and we ask that if they sign up, they provide back 25% of the proceeds. And we've teamed up with the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation to outplant uh, monarch habitat across the nation in support of monarch butterfly conservation. So our goal is really kind of better insect conservation through beer uh, and making it a social enterprise and really planting back out over a million stems of monarch, of, of milkweed in support of the monarch. So if you have a craft brewery near you or interested in this, you can go to the Florida Museum's website. You can uh, you know, connect to your craft brewing uh, in your neighborhood and, and encourage them to sign up to be a participant in this initiative. I think most craft breweries love social and environmental causes. It's a great initiative and we want as many craft breweries signed up as we can possibly get. So anything all of you can do to help that process, I would be really grateful. And then lastly, just a little bit of self-promotion. As Gene mentioned, I'm, I'm an author as well. And so my goal also as a scientist is to make butterfly conservation, landscaping for wildlife, the world of insects accessible to everyone, families, adults, and children. So I, I take a lot of pride in producing uh, books and other information that can be broadly digested by a broad audience. And so these are just some of the publications that I've produced over the years. And you know, scientific publications are great, but they reach a very narrow audience. And so my goal is to ensure that the future of the insect world has a bright future. And the best way of doing that is to introduce people. Yes, sorry, sorry, I, I somehow <laughs> lost internet connection. I apologize. I don't know what happened. No problem. So you were um, wrapping it up about the conservation using beer. And um, I think that's about when we lost you. Well, I just, I just, uh, that was really the last slide. I just wanted to thank my, my lab and all the funders and collaborators and just, you know, again, emphasize that 
the projects that I showed are, are really a team effort. It's conservation is a, is a collaboration, obviously. So it's um, just very fortunate to, to work with am amazing people and uh, amazing partners. Well, thank you. Um, people really enjoyed uh, hearing your message. And we were talking when you were um, joining us again about how it's wonderful hearing just some of the positive things that are happening and, and that you're having some you know, real success in, in getting a, some more population, um, a sturdier population, a more stable population out there. One of our questions was, um, is there a certain number that you're looking at? And it, it, does that depend on the species, the individual species before you do determine that, you know, it's a more stable self-sustaining um, population? Yeah, it's, it's pretty much dictated by the conservation and management plan that's approved at the state or federal level. And they, they look at a number of different metrics from the, the total area, geographic area of occupancy, the number of populations within that area, and also whether the individual populations are decreasing, stable, or increasing. And so it's kind of a, a three-pronged approach, if you will. And then there's also some evaluation about how kind of tentative those population, mean, how, how risky those populations are. Like, are, are there a lot of potential future impacts or could be a potential impacts? Like, if you obviously, if you're on an island population, if it's stable, a tropical storm, hurricane, sea level rise is going to be a continuing, you know, worry. So it, it's stable, but to a, to a point, a disaster could wipe that out. And so there, there's a level of risk assessment that is also factored in. Absolutely. And are there any of them that are just in like one spot now that that is a huge concern? Or are there some that are, are they all a little more scattered? So hopefully, it's not going to, you know, like a hurricane or a tropical storm is not going to just wipe them all out. Yeah, there, there are there are several that are sort of um, very tenuous. So one one butterfly I did not talk about is the Florida leaf wing, which is another endemic butterfly that's listed as endangered. It only now has one population in a small area of Everglades National Park. So it is probably the most imperiled butterfly in Florida. And it's in a fire dominated system. It's a large butterfly, it needs a little more space. So the future for that butterfly is very tenuous. And then the Miami blue, which I talked about, um, you know, it's still the only existing wild populations. Of course, we're trying to change that are still within the islands of the Marquesas and Boca Grande to the west of Key West. And so those are very tenuous, right? Because of a you know, the forecast like this year for increased hurricane activity and intensity of storms, though those could be uh, truly wiped out with one event. Uh, and then certainly the future with, with sea level rise. So, you know, the, those face a lot of future, current and future threats. And so we're, we're, the goal of our work is to try to spread that risk out as far as possible. And have, thinking about sea level rise in has there been discussions about pulling populations from one spot, taking them to another, pros and cons of that? There, there certainly, there have been, and, and assisted migration uh, and that concept is, is still somewhat controversial. Um, I think there's been more discussion about, you know, as an example, I mentioned the sawgrass skipper, palatka skipper. Well, that's a butterfly that we're trying to understand what that entity actually is through some genetic work. And so if it turns out that the populations that occur in the lower keys have really unique alleles within that population or some genetic component, that is going to be important to capture. And so it might mean not necessarily moving individuals northward, but how do we, how do we capture that diversity that enables future adaptive potential for the butterfly? And so that might mean you know, if they're pretty closely related, it might be in crossing those populations, you know, or ensuring that there's more connectivity so that those, that diversity is not lost through time. Mm -hmm. um, of course, uh, there is a lot of excitement about the ant and the Miami Blue Butterfly Association. So that um, got a lot of interest. Uh, what, what is the type of ant? What is the kind of ant that so, the, so the 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 one pictured is the uh, Florida carpenter ant. There's there's two species 
within that genus, the genus Campanotus. But these are the same carpenter ants that you might have in your yard or if you've had any pest issues in your house. They're a large ant and they're one of the more common tenders of that butterfly in South Florida. But we found through our research and in the field that there are probably a range of about 13 different ant species, some native, some non-native that will, will actively tend uh, that butterfly. But because the carpenter ant is large uh, and fairly common, it, it's a really good partner for the mommy blue because it can defend that caterpillar really well. It has, it's a large ant, it can protect the ant, the, the larva quite, quite easily. And where we found populations of Miami blue doing well, the ant populations are also doing well. So there, there is, you know, and from the, some of the research that one of my graduate students did that really showed that that protective benefit is really significant. We, we really do feel that that association in the field is, is necessary for any place that we put the butterfly back into. And in one of the photos you had, uh, it was a collage, and you had um, syringes with kind of an orangey substance. What was that? So that's, that's, that was Gatorade. So, you know, so when you breed butterflies in large numbers in a laboratory setting, we, we don't have the luxury of bringing real flowers into the lab. And so what we found is a really great method is we, we use outdoor fly cages to get butterflies to mate. We bring those females into the lab. We set them up in very small containers because females, they get stimulated to lay eggs in, a, so, you know, in contact with the host plant. So you can confine them on the host. You can get a lot of productivity, but because they, you can't put flowers into that cup, we use uh, Q-tips that are hydrated with an artificial nectar, which in our context is Gatorade. And that's not because we're the University of Florida, we have to use Gatorade, but we actually evaluated the different types of artificial nectar. And it turns out that Gatorade, particularly melon flavored Gatorade, works exceptionally well and it adds to the longevity of the butterfly and the butterfly that can lay eggs and they can feed when they want in that cup, which reduces our labor and it increases, like I said, the longevity and the productivity. So in the wild, the mommy blue adult butterfly might live on average three and a half days. In the lab, they can live 35 or 40 days in that environment. And the more days they live, the more eggs they will produce. So you know, it just isn't, it's an exponential sort of effect there. And so, and because oftentimes we have hundreds of butterflies, you know, it, it takes a lot of energy to feed them. So this is a quick and easy way for us to feed them. They can feed when they want and they live happy lives and productive lives. So you put from a syringe, the melon flavored Gatorade onto a Q-tip mm -hmm. and yeah, then we, they we, feed yeah, from the Q-tip. Yeah, we inject the, the tip of the syringe goes into the, the cotton and just soaks that and then that lasts for you know several hours and the adult butterflies can feed on their own. So it's it's really easy to go through and replenish the the nectar, the artificial nectar that way and gives gives a great opportunity for them to feed when they want. And then you don't have to handle the butterfly. You don't have to do anything that might put the butterfly at harm. So I used to work somewhere that occasionally we would get in shipments uh, for of butterflies because the location also hosted weddings and we would provide that um, melon flavored um, Gatorade to them. What, what is the current thought about bringing in butterflies and then releasing them? Because I've, I've read that there could be concerns about like diseases being spread, of course, releasing non-natives if they're not from that area. What, what have you found? What are your thoughts about that? Well, I, I um, so I'll say a couple of things on that. So those two points that you made are, are, are valid. We, we don't want to you know, you know, right now, if you have an event, you can purchase butterflies from a butterfly farm in Florida, but you do have to realize that, okay, the South Florida butterfly community is very different than the North Florida butterfly community. So if you, if you release a species that really lives in South Florida in the Jacksonville area, you know, you're doing that butterfly disservice. It might not have a resource to, you know, to thrive. And you're also mucking up the science because if we go out there and we monitor and you know, right now through like iNaturalist, we use those data to understand where, where species occur, how that changes over time. So if you get a record from the Jacksonville area of a South Florida butterfly, you don't know, is that a natural record? Is that been blown in by a hurricane? Or is that an artifact of releases from an event? And then the other thing I'll say is that uh, I'm, I'm certainly against 
anything that makes living things a commodity, uh, you know, we, 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 we should be good stewards of the environment. And that means caring for the organisms as well. And so if you, you buy butterflies for an event release, do you have the expertise to keep those butterflies safe? And are, are we really using butterflies as just like throwing rice in the air? Is that, that's, mm -hmm. that's probably not the best thing to do for the organism. So I, I would be generally strongly against those type of releases. I just don't think they, I think they, they send a bad message overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was able to get them away from releasing the white peace doves because hawks were going and picking them off as it, they it, were it, being exactly. released. So yeah, yeah and, absolutely. And, and it, you know, and, and also, you know, if you don't care for the butterflies before you do something like that, it can lead to, you know, death on the butterfly side and disappointment on the, on the human side. So it's just, I think, you know, throw right, throw, throw, throw something environmentally appropriate. Not rice, you know. <laughs> bird seed, if you must. Yeah, throw bird, yeah, bird seed, obviously. I mean, not, and, not rice. Yeah, and pelt the bride and groom with something. Um, we had a question about tagging of the Miami blue butterflies. Do the adults get tagged? Because you had the kind of the temporary tagging for the, the pupae. What about the adults? Do they ever get tagged? They, they do. And so we, we do use mark recapture um, to track individuals and also to denote those individuals that are released from the lab versus potentially produced in the wild. So that you can, again, write a, a small number on the underside of the hind wing uh, without harming the butterfly at all. And it can actually be visible from quite a, a distance away, especially if you're using binoculars. And the people of the community, the general folks shouldn't be going out and snatching out butterflies and writing numbers on them with Sharpies. No, right? no, not, no, not at all. <laughs> yeah. This is, the, you know, this is um, sort of targeted research where we're trying to understand some question like, you know, um, how long are they living? How far are they move? You know, something, something else. So it's not just a fun exercise. It actually, you know, generates meaningful data. Exactly. And then the butterflies that are in, you know, most people's yards, what can we do to help them um, put in host plants? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, at any given location in Florida, reliably, an average person could, again, this varies depending on where you are and how much land you have around you, but roughly there are about 70 species at any given location in Florida that are around that general area. That doesn't mean you're gonna attract all of them, but there's still a lot that you can attract. And so in order to make your yard or your landscape more butterfly friendly, I, I, I would sort of argue sort of four things. One is, you know, minimize the pesticides that you use in your yard because butterflies are insects and they're gonna be affected by direct application or drift. Maximize the floral resources. Butterflies are flower visitors. So start with the flowers first. And then once you know the butterflies that are found in your area that reliably come to your yard, then you can tailor the host plants to the butterfly species you actually know are there. If you try to reverse engineer that and say, well, I'm planting the host plant for this butterfly, that butterfly may never visit your yard. It might not even be in your area. So you probably are gonna be disappointed. And then the last thing, so some of the work that, that we've done in suburban landscapes, which has been pretty interesting is that we found that the three things that really drive insects coming to your yard are the number of species of blooming plants that you have, the total amount of bloom that you have, and then the evenness of the community that you have. And so what that means is that instead of taking the kid in the candy store approach and buying, say, one of 100 different species, pick, pick like 10 good flowering plant species and maximize the number of those plants in your yard, kind of creating drifts of color and, and I think the reason that that modulates the other effects and really kind of synergizes that is butterflies and other insects are visual when they search the environment. They're like, they're like us, they're drawn to waves of color. And so that'll be much more design driven, of, appropriate for our eyes and, and will actually attract more insects if you kind of create clusters of color or drifts of color in your landscape. Absolutely. And we find that too in hummingbirds, trying to attract hummingbirds, you, you cluster, you have the, yep. the reds and oranges and absolutely. Um, and then for that milkweed, like the, the tropical milkweed, the, the um, one that has the orange and the, the red and all, are you recommending that people not use that at this time? 
that's that's a hard recommendation because it's the most commercially available and people are still having trouble finding native milkweeds. I would certainly recommend using native milkweeds if people can find it. Uh, and so, you know, definitely visit your local native nurseries, your specialty nurseries, you know, go to plant sales from the Native Plant Society. You know, when you go to a nursery, they don't have it, tell them they should carry it. I mean, it's kind of the chicken and the egg as well. And then, you know, if you can't find native, then I'm not saying it's a horrible plant, but it, it does three things potentially that are damaging to the monarch. One is it, it, it harbor, you know, if it's grown commercially, it, it probably has been, has been treated with chemicals, which we don't really know how long these chemicals reside in the plant. And it depends on how much were added to the plant, what kind of cocktail of chemicals were used in production uh, and the situation in the plant, how the plant was grown. So that, that's a, a negative, right? And so if you, if you do have to buy that plant, start it from seed where you know it's not gonna be loaded with chemicals, buy it from a reliable source, maybe a specialty nursery that touts you know, not using harmful chemicals. Uh, you know, always ask if it's been treated. If you, if you can't find out if it's been treated, use the eye test. You know, do you see any munching on the leaves? If you don't see that, I would avoid it. Uh, the other two things that that plant does that are potentially negative is it potentially can disrupt the monarch migration in Florida. Uh, there's been really nice study by Sonia Altizer at the, the, at the University of Georgia, which showed that when monarchs that are migrating southward, when they encounter that plant, they will fall out of migration and lay eggs on that plant. And that can disrupt that migration through the deep south. And it also can promote winter breeding along the Gulf Coast. And we, we all want butterflies in our yard year round, but you gotta think what's biologically appropriate for the organism. In January in North Florida, there should not be a monarch in your yard. If there is, then what's gonna happen? A freeze or frost event is gonna happen and it's gonna take out your plant, it's gonna kill your butterfly. So it's gonna lead to those populations being sink populations of, of doing harm to the broader conservation of the monarch. So, you know, buy the plant cautiously. If you do have it in your yard and you live north of Lake Okeechobee, our recommend recommendation is cut it back to the ground around Halloween and do not allow it to be vegetative until uh, the last week of February or so. And that way it'll preclude winter breeding in your yard. Great, great advice. One last question. That Pine Rocklands down around Miami, University of Miami owned it. They were selling it and the developer that had bought it was going to put in a Walmart. Did that end up getting developed, that land? Unfortunately, yes. Um, so yeah, it's just that, that habitat type has been eroded away. And unfortunately, you would have hoped that with several listed species there, that would not have happened, but it, it unfortunately did. And so it's really a shame because it did support, you know, some really unique plants. It supported, it was, you know, the bonneted bat uh, flew in that area. Several species of butterflies were known to occur that there that were declining or listed. So it's just really, really unfortunate. However, the, I will say the neighbor, which uh, several neighbors, including Zoo Miami, are doing really wonderful things with habitat restoration on their property and neighboring property. So luckily there are good conservation partners close by that are trying to make up for some of those losses and are, you know, really trying to be, you know, superior stewards to, um, to that landscape type. And with you being associated with the University of Florida and um, the University of Florida IFAS has uh, community extension services, um, maybe people could recommend that the master gardeners get into more native plants and, and do that. I saw that um, Karen posted that um, the Ocala UFIFAS extension, they offer native plants. And that might be something that um, the folks in attendance could even, you know, spur that. A lot of times people want to know what can I do. And, oh, definitely. And that would be a wonderful thing. Go up and get some more inspiration visiting uh, Dr. Daniel's lab. You know, go up there and see the uh, butterfly exhibits and all. So thank you so much for joining us. This was absolutely fantastic. We greatly appreciate you spending this time with us and sharing all that you're doing. And, uh, you know, also for plugging along because it, you know, there are those ups and downs and sharing with us some of your successes and continuing to do what you're doing because that gives us hope too. So thank you so much, Dr. Daniels, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you so much. 
We'll see you all next week, uh, Wednesday at 10 o'clock. Bye-bye.